Okay, so um, the fault you're off, Glare, quick threatening is here and not. As Misha Kanako Hiki, Astuna Magan, Agusavano or on Vore Dumse, a kind to knock their son on Krista Parik Brachnock, Frey Parik Brachnock, Agusano Queen, and four on Bert Far Shop Boss, Yugognaf Block, a sublime Nila Negate, Fehe Zahain. Um, you're all very welcome here tonight again to Tresson and Tira. My name is Kenneth Hickey uh, from Dunamagan, and for the people who aren't from Kilkenny, Dunamagan is a, is a very small village down in the south of Kilkenny. It's a real honour for me to be talking tonight about uh, Pat Welch and, and Sean Quinn, or John Quinn, uh, who fought in the Irish War of Independence. Both, both of these men uh, were, were shot on this day, 99 years ago, in the hills of Tullerone and both of them uh, died, um, John dying the, the, that, that next day, and Pat Welch dying then four days later. Uh, tonight, our, our speaker is Owen Swinton Walsh. Owen has already been on Tratton the Tira, speaking about the War of Independence. Owen is the author of Kilkenny in the Times of Revolution, 1900 to 1923. So a fantastic book and well worth a read. So for me personally, I think it's great that we are talking about the life of Pat Welch, and Sean Quinn from the War of Independence, um, because I suppose everyone will be familiar with the so-called, I suppose, big names, O'Malley and Robinson and Breen and Collins and all of these guys that were really at the top of the ladder in terms of the War of Independence. But without the likes of Pat Welch and Sean Quinn and I suppose the foot soldiers, you know, uh, Collins and Breen and all these guys couldn't have achieved what they set out to achieve. Um, so I think it's fantastic that we keep the names of these local heroes alive as well. And certainly in Dunamagan, uh, we make a huge effort every year to keep the name of Pat Welsh alive, which I believe is the, is the minimum that these men deserve for the sacrifice that they have made for, for their country back during the War of Independence. So as I said, we have Owen Swinton Walsh here tonight to, to speak on the topic. So without further ado, I might pass you over to Owen. And um, if people have any questions or anything like that, you can put it into the chat box there. And we might ask Owen a few questions then at the end of the, of, uh, the talk, if that's okay with Owen. Over to you, Owen. Thanks a million, uh, Canis. Uh, I'll just share my screen here now. Hopefully it'll work. And just let me know if it doesn't. Uh, one second. Oops, so easy. Uh, thanks for having me, first of all. Um, I just want to, uh, it, it, as we're doing this because today is the 13th of May. Um, as Kana said there, and it's 99 years ago today when this uh, event occurred that saw the death of these two men straight in front of you there. So on the left is Pat Welch from Dunamagan, and on the right there with the hat and the cigarette in his mouth is Sean Quinn of Mulnahone. It was his adopted uh, parish, but um, I suppose if you're not from Kilkenny and you're going to go and well, what use is this to me or uh, you know, what interest is this to me, I suppose what I would say is that every kind of parish in uh, Ireland had a Pat Welsh or a Sean Quinn. And, you know, I think it's good to all these little micro history or micro studies make up the big picture of what actually happens during the Irish War of Independence. So it's important to know them. And also I've, I've approached kind of the research of, of these on nearly a pure history basis. So even for someone in your local community that you think you'd like to know more about, you can, you can follow the same format. It's just the same kind of primary or secondary sources, not to get too nerdy about it. But I think um, it could be done and just to use this as a, as a case study. But... Um, just to start off, um, as Kenneth said, uh, Dunamagan, that's what he, where he was talking about, famed Dunamagan there, just in the south, just south of Kilkenny, for anyone that doesn't know, Mulnahone, it's not too far away, just over the Tipperary border. Um, but the one thing about Mulnahone, which is quite different, is Kilkenny itself, the county, was all one brigade, but Mulnahone was the exception where Mulnahone was in the West Kilkenny uh, Brigade, or as it became known, the 7th Battalion. And they, they just jumped into that in 1919 because it was just logistically easy for them. They did a lot of their business in Callan town, so, um, and they would have a lot of friends there. So instead of going down to Clonmel or up to Turles, they decided to put, throw their loss in with the 7th Battalion. So it, it, it's... Um, that that's what we're going to be kind of talking about today. Um, you, you can see you can see it on the map there anyway. But it's it's if you're not from around, we're just uh, very close to Tipperary border. Obviously, Carlow's on the other side. Waterford's down here, and Leash is above. Um, a nice part of the country as well. It wouldn't be too too kind of uh, hilly or anything like that. But just to give you a background on Pat Welch before we go into it, so you get a feel of the character that we're going to be talking about today. Uh, Pat Welch was born to the Magan in 1887. 
Um, his parents, and this is his parents' marriage cert, were Matthew Welch and Mary Nail, or Mary O'Neill. Uh, they were married on the 29th of July, 1886. Uh, Matthew Welch was from Newmarket, which is the village just over, over away, a few miles away from Dunamagan, and Mary Neal was actually from Dunamagan. Uh, the one thing you will see here, though, is they were from publican families. So I would say this is an Irish version of an arranged marriage um, to guess uh, to, two publicans together. Matthew was, was, wasn't the oldest boy, so his brother had taken over the pub in Newmarket. And obviously, for whatever reason, he married into Mary Neal and got a pub in the bargain as well. They were a little bit older getting married as well, uh, mid to late, sorry, mid to late thirties, yes. So they were a little bit, a little bit older for the, which is average now, but at the time it was quite, uh, quite older. They got married in Dunamagan Church. That church is now gone. There's a new church in Dunamagan, but it's also where they would bury their son, um, thirty-three years later. Um, and there's you can see the bridesmaids. That's John Lee and Mary Cody as the chief, uh, the uh, groom and the bridesmaids. And passes a quick turnaround time. Passes born. They're married in July, and the following May made fort. Uh, 1887, honeymoon baby, Pat Sporn. In, uh, interesting about him is he would be their only child for whatever reason that is. Uh, he would be their only child um, and uh, a well-liked uh, member of the community, but a very um, uh, well thought of uh, person. Looking up the 1901-1911 census, which is kind of uh, the, the bread and butter of historians, but it does tell you a little bit. So you've got Matthew Welch and Mary there, this is the 1901 one, and Patrick there is 13 years old. And you can see his parents are a little bit older than usual, as there was a publican and a shop, they also had a shop there as well. Um, and again, he's still living with them at 25, when he's 25, his parents are now over 60 uh, in the 1911 census. And this was probably um, more to do, and, and it's just an interesting thing I, I like to think about was, if Pat had other brothers and sisters, would he be long gone? Uh, he was well educated. Uh, his parents had given him secondary school education, but he was the only one to take over the pub and look after his parents in their old age. So he was, uh, he was around even when he was older. Um, the Welsh homestead, and again, this is the B1 form of all those 1911 censuses, and just it's good at telling us um, what kind of life they would have had relative to the time. So again, it's the public house. Um, and then they've got all these little, um, on the census, they've got all these uh, numbers here. Um, uh, you know, how many walls are in the roof, rooms are in the house, windows in the front, which is a sign of wealth as well. And all that adds up to 12, which gives them a first class house. Okay, so they were one of the only, well, one of the only first class houses in the villages in Nomagan, which would give them, a, you would, which would imply a better standard of living. Um, I suppose it's, it's, it's hard for us to look back in 2020 vision. When I was studying this when I was younger, I used to always go, how can these be like, you know, the middle classes and uh, doing well when they have no toilets, no running water, um, no electricity, and they work very hard. But just relative for the time, they were actually uh, doing, doing quite well. Um, Pat it gets a good education. He gets educated in Boris School, National School, which is the, the main school. Um, the main um, school in, in Dunamagan there. Um, it's long gone now, but it was the main school for Dunamagan. My grandfather went there 10 years after this. Uh, and then he moved on to Kells. He was obviously very bright because he was also at the secondary school. Not everyone uh, were lucky enough to have a secondary school education in um, this era. Christian Brothers is where he went in Callan. Um, so he is, and again, you have to pay money to go to secondary school, believe it or not. So he, he was doing quite well. He was obviously very bright, articulate, and well-liked. That comes up quite a lot. But because he's an only child, and this is the thing we'll talk about with memory at the end, you do get the, the thing with Pat in that a lot of the oral history is gone because he only had his parents, obviously. Uh, they, when they both died, he'd had no brothers and sisters, no children of his own, no nieces and nephews. So it, this is the only way we can kind of get a, a picture of the man. Um, one of his main achievements in life, even for such a young age, he was a founding member of the Dunamagan Gaelic League Club, very passionate about learning the Irish language. The Dunamagan actually had, uh, was one of the last to lose the Irish, even in the... Um, Pre the famine, there were still some Irish spoken in the Dunamagan area. And also, he was one of the founding members of the Glory Rovers, the original Dunamagan hurling club, which um, Dunamagan, we all know, is a famous club, won the All Ireland last year. 
um, the Junior All-Ireland. Um, Canis, of course, and his brother Noel uh, Hickey would have been well-versed in uh, wearing the black and amber jersey for Kilkenny every now and again. So um, Pat was one of the founding members of, uh, of that and left the lasting legacy, of course, in Dunhamagan. And after 1916, he's heavily involved in setting up the local Sinn Féin club where he becomes secretary. And I, I kind of, the way I just look at this is that it, it, what's kind of, if you look at someone like Pat Welch, he should be, um, with the education he got and received in this time in Ireland, he should be sent off to either become a priest or at least become a profession, professional, whether that be in banking or, um, you know, some whatever profession it would be, because he has secondary school education and he's doing quite well and his parents would have an above average a level of income. Um, but he stays at home. So I think actually what's profession's lost in Dunham Magan's gain because you have this highly edu educated, articulate young man right in the heart of the village who's doing all this extracurricular stuff. Uh, he's also a referee for the GE and he's, you know, as referees go, he's actually well, he's actually well liked. Um, and he also organises the set up of the Dunham Magan Parish Volunteers who are renamed the IRA, of course, in 1919. And he becomes the captain of the IRA in Dunhamagan and that company is B Company with the whole Dunhamagan Parish area and it's in the eventually the 8th B Kilkenny Battalion. Originally it was in the West Kilkenny um, Battalion when it was smaller, when the whole thing was smaller in Kilkenny, but the 8th Battalion was set up in 1920. So he's one of the, the captains, one of the leaders in the in the 8th Battalion, which is headquarters in Hogginstown. Um, and I just want to highlight this, that very early on, Pat Welch is involved and his name is out there because he writes a letter to Isaac Bell. Isaac Bell is the master of the Kilkenny Greyhounds, a very um, auspicious um, hunting group, uh, full paid full paid job on your master of Kilkenny foxhounds. And they hunted uh, all around Kilkenny for a big chunk from, we'd say, October right through to the spring. And Sinn Féin uh, put out a thing saying they wanted to stop it. This is right uh, very early, only a few weeks after the doll is set up and so had the and all that. In January 1919, Pat Welsh is writing, putting his name on letters to the uh, head of the Kilkenny Fox Hunts going, if you come through Dunhamagan or any of areas, we're going to stop you, we're going to block you. Um, the master of the Kilkenny Fox Hounds is a guy called Isaac Bell. He's an American guy. And um, he is not happy, of course. He says in his response, and he, and he says he received a letter from Patrick Welch and he responded back to him. But he says in his response in the 28th, this is published in Kilkenny People, um, in Kilkreen House, which is now a hospital in Kilkenny. That's where he was based. He says, your resolution as to the stoppage of hunting, um, I have it just to hand. I know nothing or do I take an interest in politics and in no way attempt to in dictate to you on that subject. But having devoted my whole life, energy and income to fox hunting, I'm writing to you on a subject I understand. Fox hunting as carried out by me and all of the... Uh, master of fox, uh, fox hunters uh, I know are, are, is always kept free from politics. Uh, all are equally welcome at meets and my, and my hounds as long as they conduct themselves as sportsmen. And um, it's, he's a li little bit disingenuous there, uh, Isaac Bell, because it was quite a much of a class thing. You know, you had, you had to have horses and you had to have, have the right clothes and, and, uh, and the like. So it would have been very much uh, for people who could afford it and for it to be leisurely uh, to, to, to do the fox hunting. Also, um, I would say about kind of fox hunting, it wasn't, uh, you know, you know, if you were a labour farm labour and you turned up, you wouldn't be, you wouldn't be. So it's a little, a little bit disingenuous. But my point here, anyway, I'm going off a piece there, is that Pat Pat Welch is involved in the very start of the War of Independence. He's in there putting his name down. He's not afraid to put his head above the parapet. Another father, Pat Welch's influences. He went to school in the Christian Butters, which were usually more patriotic than the average school in Ireland, even though um, uh, they were subject to a good few beatings, beatings in Callan back in the day. I'm sure Callan would like to be, still do that to the odd time. Um, but also in Dunhamagan, they were lucky to have a priest called Father Tom Henderbury. Father Tom, along with his, one of his best friends, um, Father Delahunty of Callan, which is very close, uh, were very outspoken in their support of the Sinn Féin move, movement the Irish Republic and 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 that. Um, so to have the priest's endorsement, if you'd like, that he could stand in the pulpit uh, on a Sunday in Dunhamagan and say, look at the, what the uh, terrible people done up in Kilkenny, the terrible British Crown forces did, uh, would very much endorsement for the community to support the cause. Uh, not uh, a lot of priests did that, and a lot of priests would have been completely against us. Um, at best, a lot of priests were neutral, um, bishops, uh, especially the Bishop Fostery, was very much against the IRA and what was falling, specifically for the violence um, and the hunger striking and things like that that were involved, which they felt was immoral. Um, 
so it was it was a, a boon to have him and i'm sure um uh, uh father tom and uh pat got on like a house on fire um what happened and i just put this here now and it, father henry writes a letter again to the kilkenny people and this is in 1920 but he is saying what happened when his house is raided so we're talking about september 1920 this is when the auxiliaries have just arrived in kilkenny the auxiliaries are kicking uh people up the arse basically, especially with their own uh, friends in the Crown Forces where they're saying, look, we need to shake in a bit of discipline into this county. And they're going around raiding. Anyone that has any kind of name, we're going to raid. And the priest writes a letter to say what actually happened to him in Dunamagan, in the curate's house. He said, when he was out in his absence uh, last Saturday, the military armed to the teeth raided my house. They left it in the most disgraceful manner. They scattered broadcast my books, receipts, letters, and past books in which I kept parochial accounts. They read my private correspondence, uh, even letters I received from clergy and lacy, which is terrible sin, uh, Catholic and non-Catholic alike. On my return, uh, yeah, um, on my return in 1916, uh, they scanned the parochial accounts and even my uh, attention book, which is the prayer book, I think, um, that the priest used to carry around. They carried away some copies of Mishnach, uh, some letters in Irish and English, and one copy of a book called The Man Called Pierced, least as they asserted, it should contaminate the boys. When I returned home, the house seemed as if it was being ransacked by a troop of peddlers. I always thought that the uniform of the military officers of any civilised country was that of gentlemen. And he signs it off, Misha Tomas Henry CC. So you can see how you know, anger could be stoked and you know, the community would not be uh, happy with the, the heavy-handed approach of the, of the Crown forces. Oh, and can I and, just come in there for a minute? Yeah. Um, just in relation to Father Delonty, I don't know, would you be aware of the incident in 1917, which apparently happened in the hall in Dunamagan? Oh, yeah, I forgot about that. Yeah, so the singing of a song, wasn't it? That um, Father Hennebury asked Father Delonty during a, well, I suppose it was a fundraiser, really, uh, to step forward, and Father Delonty stepped up and he asked the men of the room to cover their ears and the women to join in the chorus. Yeah, and yeah, sang, um, What was it? Um, who dared to speak of Easter week? It was, yeah, and it's... It was amazing because I find that amazing because it was, uh, it was, it was, it was the first of January. So it's literally not even a year, 1917. So it's not even a year from, um, from since the executions in 1916. And they're, they're singing songs, they had songs written about that already. But yeah, that happened in the Magan. Yeah, and you're right. Yeah, they were, they were very close pals, uh, Della Hunty. Yeah. And yet there was a whole fight. So I don't know Della Hunty, who's a ne- uh, nephew of um, uh, Father Della Hunty, or grandnephew, I can't remember. No, I think it's nephew. Uh, he was uh, involved in uh, researching it. And they had a whole file on Father Della Hunty and a little bit on, on Father Henry. Yeah. So, so that yeah, went right was, to the top. Like, I think that was reported in the Times in London. So, you, you know, <laughs> I suppose Pat Welsh was kind of like a product of his environment you're talking about the anger when the priest's house was raided but when pat sees i suppose you know this being investigated right up to the top of british um uh, authority in ireland at the time you can understand the anger as you're talking about there and uh, why pat might have got involved in the war of independence oh exactly exactly you're totally right and and i think uh, as well to have the priest on side with pat because if Pat was out on his own or but to have the kind of respectability of a priest who's the most respected person in the parish um to be on your side and to be fighting the same cause was a big thing because there's lots of places in ireland where that wasn't the case yeah. so it was it was it, it was lucky and could stoke up a little bit of anger as well which is great and it's probably why people in the magna are so supportive of the independence cause as well more in some places but Sean Quinn is complete contrast to Pat in his upbringing and probably joined for completely different reasons. He wouldn't have had as much education. Um, he was um, born in Mullingar in County Westmead, actually, in 1898. So he was a good 10 years younger, nearly 10 years younger than Pat. And he was sent to the Fairy House Industrial School in Clonmel, um, following the death of his father, who was a butcher, and to ease pressure on his mother. And again, a lot of the times I don't know the backstory to this. Maybe some of the family would... I uh, would know about this, but there, I think they were all up in Westmead, that, um, you know, that even if a priest could come along and say, right, I'm taking away one of the young lads and send them away, um, you know, you might not have any choice in the matter. And so he would have had a quite sort of a, a tough upbringing. There was at least 150 young boys in that um, industrial school at any one time. Um, his apprentice staff, though, because I've tried to use to give you apprenticeship once you leave so he could be some contributor to the state in some way. And... Um, he was a baker, apprentice baker in Clonmel and Mullinahone for a while, which he disliked this and he started, gave up on the apprenticeship and started doing farm labouring, wanted to be outdoors and all that. Um, this led him to join the Mullinahone IRA. Um, I think maybe for more adventure, but also as he's listened to the experience of an actual family unit, he also had nothing to lose or people to judge him. 
which was a lot different than we'll say maybe Pat, but also a lot of people where their parents would say, no, you're not getting involved in this thing, or you don't, you're going to lose your job if you get involved, or you know, you're going to go to hell or something if you get involved. He didn't have a lot of that baggage, which I think uh, helped Sean, but completely contrasting to, uh, Pat, to Pat Welsh. Um, just before, and this is what's kind of unfortunate about Pat, is he was arrested and only released just a few days before he was killed or he was shot. Um, he was arrested on the 8th of December 1920, a holy day again, which is always bad, uh, at the family poem in Dunnamagan. It was raided by the Crown forces. Um, here's a charge sheet that was, uh, that was written up at the time. I think it was down Waterford Prison, this was done. And um, what's great about this from a historical point of view is that all these, these records are in the British archives in England, um, but they were digitized in 2016 and posted. So it's great, you don't even have to go to London CDs anymore. Um, but it says at the top, Patrick Welch, Dunamagan, County Waterford. Excuse their ignorance on that one, but um, it's, and you can see he was arrested on the 8th and he had a court martial on the 25th of January. Martial law had come in in Munster, most of Munster in the end of December, or around December um, 1920. And then in Kilkenny, it had come in in January, the early January. So you don't have a civil trial. You don't have any uh, people, as people would consider fairness. Uh, you get court martialed. Um, and he, he gets a sentence on 25th of January, and that sentence, he's guilty of all charges, and he's sentenced to 84 days in prison with hard labor. Hard labor. Um, and then what was the charge? And you can just about make it out, but I'll read it out if you can't. The accused was uh, held up in the public house in the Magan and searched. Seven copies of Untoglocked, which is the IRA Irish Volunteer Magazine, were found, and two certificates of the Dáil Aaron IRA loan. Um, which was what Pat would have been doing for the whole of 1919, 1920, collecting money to support the new state because he was secretary of the Sinn Féin Club. He would be going around house to house and all that, collecting money for, for that purpose. And again, the ver two very trivial things to get 80, 80, however many days, hard labour. But that's, but it's more than that. It's, they know Pat Welch is the, is the bad guy in that community. They could pick out, um, give me a village and give me the ringleaders and that, we'll arrest them. And all they need is something like that. Something written in Irish, a doll loan or a magazine, and it's good enough for them. So it's, uh, it's, uh, it's an easy one. He's an easy, he's an easy fish to get because he's, he's well known. Um, and then just leading up to the men's deaths then in, um, in May. So we're just going into May now, and we were just going into the 13th of May, um, obviously now, but just the very start of May, Pat was, um, celebrated his 34th birthday in prison and he's released on the 10th of May only a few days before he's shot and of course it's the war of independence is at its most deadly at this stage he realizes he will most likely be arrested again so he decides to go on the run he probably would be arrested again for some innocuous charge um so he goes in the run he goes in the run again uh fortuitously or unlucky as it turned out the uh, 7th Battalion uh, Flying Column, which is also known as an ASU, were then under the command of Ned Elward of, Cavan, or, or of Callan, were billeting in Dunamagan. So Pat joined up. Sean Quinn had already been with this column for a number of months, and he was one of the party who dramatically escaped from Gary Rickon House in March 1920, where uh, Quinn and Elward and a few others, Lahey, shot themselves out of Gary Rickon House near the Tip Kilkenny border. They were completely surrounded by Crown forces. Uh, they killed one guy in the process, probably shot um, by uh, Sean as well as a number of the others. And the rifle that Sean had when he was caught up in uh, Tullerone on the 13th of May was a rifle he'd actually taken off a, uh, off a Crown force black and tan he'd shot in Gary Rickon two months previously. Um, but also in Dunamagan, they were staying out in Dangan Moor and Shortlestown and that part of Dunamagan with numerous different families. But um, they had joined up the farm, this like super, super flying column. And they had joined with uh, the man, Sean Hogan, who everyone knows from the Knock Long uh, fame, the Knock Long ambush, one of the big uh, heroes of Tipperary. And to make a total uh, flying column of 60 men, so it's a lot. They had joined up just close to Wine Gap and had moved up towards Dunamagan. Um, and we believe it was more Ernie O'Malley's had pushed this. Ernie O'Malley had taken over the whole second Southern Division, which included Kilkenny, Tip, and uh, East Limerick. He had said, right, take some pressure off Tip and maybe the uh, Cork as well. So have a few, cause of the trouble in Kilkenny, basically. And we'll get some of the police from Cashel and, and Turles and all that happened to go to Kilkenny. So um, they ended up in Kilkenny for that reason. 
Um, and they made their way north after staying in Dunamagan the night with Pat in, in tow. They made their way up to, and Pat was the only Dunamagan man in the flying column at this stage. He just joined up with them. Um, he, uh, they ended up, they went north to village Kilmana where they tried to cause a bit of trouble to get the British to come out um, so they could ambush them. They uh, oh, and, to, yeah. I just, yeah, I suppose maybe um, when, when, when you're saying about Pat being a wanted man, he absolutely was, yeah. And I suppose just from research I'm doing, like Pat would have been hi- highly involved in Hugginstown as well, wouldn't he? With the taking of the barracks in Hugginstown. Yeah, sorry, I, I didn't mention that. I kind of skipped over it because yeah, I was on yeah. time. But yeah, Hugginstown, the, we talked about it already, but the, it was only the third most successful uh, capture of a barracks in Ireland mm. during the War of Independence. It was captured in March 1920. Pat Welch was the Dunhamagan Company who'd been involved in that. Yeah, you're yeah. totally right. So he, ha- he had been, and he would have known then some of the Callan lads and yeah. some of the Monday Holy lads and a lot of the people he was, he, was, so. he was on the radar, I'd say, at this stage. You know, he for, was definitely uh, on the radar. He was definitely on the radar. Yeah. He was only went home after and uh, um, Huggins and all that, but he was very much, and like, it, w- it wouldn't be that hard for the Crown Forces to go, right, give me all the villages and give me all the ringleaders. Yeah, There's yeah, someone yeah. going to say it, and it wouldn't yeah. be rocket scientists to, to, to figure yeah. it out. And I believe just just um, before he went on the run, there they were actually on the way to Callan for a planned attack in Callan, and they uh, oh. they met with uh, British forces on the Haggard Road, as we call it in Kells, which is about five miles from Pat's house. And a skirmish happened, and during this skirmish, um, Pat's coat was actually left behind, and his oh, yeah. um, his name was on the collar of the coat. Yeah, so that coat was picked up, and obviously the British then knew well, this is the guy that we need to get. So there was no going home for Pat at that stage. So that's- There's no going home, yeah. And I think, yeah, I, I, I think I heard that story. And even though it could have been that someone as well had his coat on him or something, you know, mm. but his name was on it. So he yeah. would have been picked up. And they, they often done that, the British kept on putting him into prison. Anyone yeah, else yeah. would cause him trouble. But just to show you, yeah, ge- geographically wise, if anyone doesn't know Kilkenny, Dunhamagna is here. That's where they were billeted. They were going up towards Kilmana. And the night after they'd been in the Magnum, they stayed with the Tehans in, in Shipton House in Kilmana, which were a group of women there who always looked after the IRA columns. There were people calling there the whole time. And even in uh, De Valera and Dan Breen and all them were calling there uh, during the uh, Civil War as well. And it was burnt down actually by Free State Forces in the Civil War. But they stayed in Kilmana, just our Shipton, just south of Kilmana. And then on the 12th of May, uh, yesterday, 99 years ago, they took over the entire village very dramatically. Um, but just as well, just so we know that we're going to be talking about African Manor, we're going to talk about Tullerone, uh, which is a village just north of that, and then Torbrist, which is where Nocknagress is, just a little bit north of uh, Tullerone again, is where um, the fatal event occurred. Um, there are the two leaders of the flying column we just mentioned there, that's Ned Ned Edward on the left, and Sean Hogan, the bell Sean Hogan uh, on the right. And they were the two commanders. Sean was taking overall control, and he, that was his deputy, the Kilkenny, Kilkenny Flying Column leader. Um, the invasion of Kilmana was very dramatic. Uh, Dublin Castle issued a statement saying a flying column of 300 uh, Sinn Feiners took over several houses and seized telephone instruments. House posts were posted all around the village. Um, Printers' notices were, were posted up in the village of Kilmana, calling it a military area and stating that any member of the Crown forces found there was out a permit from the IRA would be shot on site. So they kind of declared a little mini republic for the 12th of May there for 12 hours. Um, Kilmana was a republic um, um, under control of the, uh, of the IRA. Um, uh, for several hours, the town was uh, uh, occupied with considerable display and military uh, ceremonial. They paraded up and down and marched up and down the streets at uh, the IRA gardens. And so Sean Hogan had no problem with this. He was, he was very cheeky and very um, uh, uh, brave. Uh, for want of a better word. Um, so they were there but from seven o'clock in the morning and we believe they were at seven o'clock in the evening. The idea is they were, and they put they rang Kilkenny as well to get the British to come out. The British weren't that stupid, the Crown Forces. They instead waited till quite late that evening and um, waited uh, until they had reinforcements. And we believe they had auxiliaries, they had police and black and tans and also the military. And then they came late, late that night. But the IRA column sensing that this was going to happen, they had left and they had gone north. As we said, they had left Kilmana that night and gone north towards Tullerone. Um, but the British were hot on their heels and the fateful day, the 13th is the next day. And um, they followed them towards uh, Tullerone. So as I said, Tullerone village was 
is down here in the bottom right of the picture. And when the column went there on between the night of the 12th and the 13th, they were spread out in the, around the number of houses. Um, the main guy they went to first, and Pat went to first, was uh, Sim Walton. Sim Walton was an icon of Kilkenny Hurling. Uh, he'd won seven Ireland medals um, in the early years, Kilkenny's first golden era from 1904 to 1913. Um, and... Uh, he was the captain in the local area. He was just pointing out, hey, go to this house, go to this house. And there was lots of scouts ready for them uh, to point them out in the house to go to. Eventually, the leaders ended up going to Kennedy's farmhouse. So this farmhouse here, which is just north of Tub, uh, Tullerone and left, it's in, down there's Tubris up here. Uh, Kennedy's farmhouse is where the leaders went. Um, and then there's a low road here that, that'll come in important nature. You can just about make it out. That's the New England road. Um, it'll, become, it'll become more clear when we're talking about the escape from this area. Um, but I, forgot, I forgot to mention the thing about Sean Hogan as well. They had a car. Sean Hogan and his column had stolen the car um, in Tipperary um, a few weeks previously. And they were driving this overlord car. And so was Ned Elward was packed into it as well. And they were driving around like military commanders. Uh, so they didn't have to trunge and walk through all the fields and dikes like the rest of their men. And a um, little bit maybe, a little bit silly in a way, just specifically for the fact that... Um, um, there was very little motor cars in rural Kilkenny in 1921, and the fact that you heard, when you heard a motor car, you was, it, was, it was an unusual noise. So you know, God, there's the sound of an engine, and um, the, it usually meant British British forces. So it wouldn't be that easy to find them. Is, is my point? Is my point there? But anyway. They arrive at Kennedy's. Sean Hogan's there, the leader, and also Ned Elward. Pat Welsh is completely different, though. He's at a separate house um, himself, uh, Sean Quinn, and a guy called uh, Paddy Power, nothing to the bookmaker. And those three are together, but in the family that they are in, the family tells them, please leave. Um, we think you're going to, this house is going to be raided. Um, will you go uh, to Kennedy's? You have to go there anyway. They had all got this dispatch saying they had to muster in Kennedy's farmhouse, the entire column, at 10 o'clock the next morning. So Pat and them arrived, and the two other men, uh, Sean Quinn, Paddy Pear, arrive in Kennedy's quite late. It's dawn, the, the sunlight, you know, it's six, seven o'clock, and they sleep in an outhouse. And that is going to be their fatal, their fatal mistake because um, they're sleeping in the outhouse, but nobody knows they're actually there, they're no, that they're in the outhouse. Um, there are about 20 others, including two leaders, in Kennedy's house. Now, there is scouts around all this area, but the British arrive quite quickly. And what um, makes them annoyed quite after is that the British usually would scan houses the whole way along the road, but they went straight for Kennedy's. So they came on top of them quite quickly. Uh, they were shouts at the, uh, get out the tans are on the lane. And this is the lane in from Kennedy's in here. Um, the men then, with Sean Quinn and, and Elward, tore down to the dikes, and I'll explain all that in a second. And all this area is fields along here. Obviously, there's a new Google map done on paint, so it's not the best I had to do it in work. But, um, and I'll explain uh, what happened later on. But they never tossed the three lads in because they never knew they were there. Kay Kennedy, the grandmother of the house, was out throwing holy water and all the men as they were running away. They were trying to get bring us their guns and weapons and everything with them as they were going. But it was only at this that... Um, Paddy Power had woken up and passed and then trying to wake Sean Quinn to get the hell out. The lads are running away. But because they were that little few minutes behind, they were a few hundred metres behind, they were always at a disadvantage. And the fact that Elward and um, Hogan did not know the lads were there. This and they is, didn't get the holy water on. No, and, they, and that's, I think that's what Kate Quinn, Kate Quinn, or Kate Kennedy, I should say, um, was always upset afterwards. Yeah. She, she, she didn't, she'd gone inside again to, to hide. And see, the car was in, they were terrified because the, the car was left in the driveway. They knew they'd lost the car, uh, Sean Hogan's car. So yeah, she blames herself. She blamed herself for not uh, protecting the lads. But this is, this is an aerial shot. Now there's the high road there, the Tubbert Road. Here's Kennedy's farmhouse and the lane on the modern era. They escaped down through fields. Again, this would be way more overgrown, a lot more dikes. They escaped along this dike along here um, and this it's this field these two fields here is where the lads ended up being shot um, and I'll explain what happens to that in a minute but the lower road is is just down here and Tehan's come into it here so the farmhouse on the lower road as well but um, I'll come back to that but this is this is this is the north side this is where the uh, the um, crown forces would have came down uh, they would have came down the uh, the the avenue here, so uh, it, it was down this lane, and this is the Kennedy's outhouse where uh, Pass and and Sean Queen spent their last 
few hours uh, sleeping in the, in Kennedy's outhouse. And this is the lane going down here into the farm, and this is looking down to the field. So you're looking at these dikes along here is where the lads would have uh, tried to escape down here. And then if I move up to the next field, you can see this is, again, the dike. You see the tree line is still there even after all these years. So this is where they would have uh, tried to have gone down. But what we do know is that the Crown forces didn't just go down the lane, they split out and went down the fields to try to cut, ab cut anyone off. So the Crown forces are there, the fields I was just going at there, they're pushing down here. The lads are trying to beat them because there's Crown forces coming up from the lower road as well. Uh, they're a little bit later, but they're coming up. So what I'm trying to do is outmaneuver them and get away. Eventually, most of the, um, most of the, the, the initial party get away, but there is a gun battle. There is a terrifying gun battle because there's kids playing in this yard who remember hearing bullets hopping off the walls where um, Crown forces are coming up here. There's Crown forces coming down there. On this side, Sean Hogan and um, Ned Elward are outside, they believe, the Crown forces coming down to this field. So they think they bested them. Uh, but they, they get into a gunfight with these guys to push them back. Uh, the Crown forces here run back and get protection from Tehans. But it, all, it does allow, it does allow um, Elward and Hogan to cross the lower road and get away, which they do. But it also, un, uh, unbeknownst to them, they've left Pat and Sean, who are in the dikes behind here, stuck behind here, um, at the mercy of the Crown forces. They've got some pushing up from the bottom and some coming from the top. This is from the lower road. So the next picture I'm going to take is looking up this direction. And you can see where the Crown forces came up here. Uh, Tehan's farmhouse is there on the left. And the shots would have been fired uh, roughly uh, up there. Here's the same image again. But what happened is the lads moved along the dike here. They were pinned down here because they couldn't, if the, they were all underneath the radar of the Crown Force there, because they were dikes, they were low, low, low. They were damp, they were wet, but at least they weren't covered. But they had to hop over a bank here, and that caused them to, to fire the shots towards Tehan so they could get away. What Pat Welch and Quinn and um, the lads decided to do, they said, okay, we're bunched going this way, let's try to go up the north way. But it's when they got up here and they're going to try to make a run across, I don't know, possibly over this direction, uh, they were met with Crown forces. Um, sorry, they were met with Crown forces. They were going to run over this direction, from the Purple Arrow. They met with Crown forces who opened fire on them from the dike. Luckily for Paddy Power, he'd slipped back down. Um, Sean Quinn caught him and he kind of pulled him back. So uh, Pat got shot in the legs. Quinn got shot twice in the stomach and the legs, but Power had fallen down back into the dike. And what Power actually ended up doing is crawling along the dike, up another kind of dike, and hiding himself. Um, and that's where he stayed for the whole evening until till nightfall, till eventually he went down to Tehans. So it was kind of a miracle that Power wasn't, wasn't captured, and he lived well into, well into old, old age. Uh, Pat was just shot in the leg which wasn't a life-threatening, even though at the time, it is and it isn't in that there's no antibiotics at the time, so the main thing is infection, infection, infection. Uh, so you don't even have something for a fever like paracetamol. also. Um, that's what's bad, but he could have been saved if he'd got um, uh, medical attention. Um, uh, he's, he's brought to, America, uh, to the Kilkenny barracks initially, and Pat passes away in Fermoy Military Hospital on Wednesday, the 8th of May, during an operation to amputate his gangrenous leg. Uh, so he took he took a good few days to die, um, and a little bit too late uh, trying to give him the um, the help that medical help he needed. The doctor in Kilkenny had sent him down to the military hospital in Fermoy for for an amputation, um, and then it just this is the record from the uh, British side. It says uh, gunshot wounds inflicted by the Crown forces in the execution of their duty, and it said Pat was found armed with a shotgun and a revolver. Shotgun wouldn't have done much. A revolver was slightly better, but Pat has been in jail for a, for a good few months, so he probably didn't have any better weapons. And there's his death cert uh, there, registered on the 18th of May. Shock following operation for gunshot wounds and gangrene of the left thigh, so it tells you specifically where he, where he was shot. Uh, death ensued within five days of no one being infected or inflicted. Um, and Sean Quinn is slightly different in that he was in and out of consciousness. Pat was moaning in pain. Um, poor Paddy Power said he could hear Pat moaning, moaning for hours that day because uh, they were left there for a while. Uh, but Quinn himself was in and out of consciousness very, very quickly. Uh, but he was still alive when he was moved. It took some time before the Crown Force, for the Crown Force to pick up the wounded men because they were still busy looking for everyone else. So they left them there. 
Uh, the men were eventually put in a horse and, and cart, which had been taken from Tien's farmhouse, and before being placed in a military lorry. The lads also went to a pub after us and left them in the lorry for a while. The pub was in Tuberus, so it took a long time to get back to the barracks. Sean suffered uh, much worse wounds than Pass. Um, and there's Sean Quinn's um, memory cards that was uh, that eventually came out. There's no photo of him on it, but um, he was eventually taken to Kilkenny Military Barracks that night. So around this time, we think it was around nine or ten o'clock on the 13th of May, which is around this time, 99 years ago, Sean Quinn actually passed away. So he passed away not not too long, bled out, uh, bled to death after being killed in James Stevens Barracks in Kilkenny, which is a British barracks at the time. He did actually have a big funeral uh, in Walnahoe even though there was a very large um, British presence there. And his funeral took place the day Pat died in Fermoy, so it was the Wednesday. Um, in the aftermath of, of what happened, the day before Sean's funeral, which was the Wednesday, and the Pat's death, so it was a Tuesday, um, uh, two informers were executed from Tubleron. These were two farm labourers and former British soldiers called Martin Darmody and Michael O'Keefe. They were executed by Ned Edward and two other members, I think, of the 7th Battalion, a flying column who went to Old Town Quarry near Tullerone, captured the two men after leaving the bar the night before and executed them in the quarry, um, specifically for um, helping the Crown Force, because the Crown Forces didn't know their way around, and these two men were found guilty of, of helping them around, pointing out houses and which way to go. Um, so again, that caused controversy in some ways in that the executions hadn't been sanctioned, and GHQ with Michael Collins, Richard McCarthy had asked uh, all executions of spies, as they were called, to be sanctioned. But um, Elward had held his own on the Monday, Tuesday night after this event and said what went wrong and that these two men were found to be the main, the main cause of them caught that morning and they were duly executed. Uh, Pat Welsh's uh, funeral took place in Dunamagan on Sunday, the 22nd of May. So it's a whole week and two days after he died. Um, John Hickey, um, Candace's granduncle and pass, hold and travel to Fermoy uh, the day before to bring back their bodies. The men uh, had to get a permit from Cannon to get down there, and Father Hennebury went with them um, to get them the permit, to use a priest to get the permit. And it was a long journey down to Fermoy through bad roads. They got a loan of a car from Egan's of Callan. Uh, the tricolour was unceremonious. He ripped off the coffin of, uh, by the Crown Forces present, and only 40 people were permitted in the graveyard in Dunamagan for the actual burial. Uh, over 2,000 people, though, attended Pat's one-year anniversary, including 600 IRA volunteers from all over the county and neighbouring Tipperary. Uh, this is the famous, there's two famous, which is in the Magan village, doesn't, hasn't changed a whole lot. The Pat Welch statue is there now. It's a bar there uh, where Welch is war and um, the other bar here, there, I'm forgetting, Townsend's and somewhere else. And uh, this is coming to one procession here. You can see horse and cart there, but you can also see it coming to one procession coming down here. And the next picture is the same place and it's an IRA procession. Uh, I happen to think, and I, I haven't found a spoken gun for this yet, I happen to think that these photos are actually taken on the one year anniversary. And the reason I'm saying that, it's very unlikely that the British would have allowed, there's so much British military presence there, uh, allowed this military formation and also an Irish tricolour, which these guys are holding here, uh, to happen at the time in May 1921. This could be actually May 1922, when they actually all met in Boris Goop Cross, which actually makes more sense because the church is here on the left, in the Magan. Um, it would, would you make more sense that they're all parading from Boris Goop Cross for his one year anniversary, anniversary to give him a proper send off? And I, I do think though, uh, Pass and Sean are the most remembered Kilkenny veterans. Um, and there's all other, this whole other study of memorials and commemorations and myths and how things are used and not used. And people always say that commemorations tell you more about the present day than they do about the actual things they're meant to commemorate. But um, people might know about Pat Welch and his life that much, but they, he is commemorated. He does tick a lot of boxes and he is um, the poster boy, I suppose, for Kilkenny at this, at this time. This is, a, this is a, a monument that was put up in the 1930s in um, this is the local Tehans, I think, the Kennedys, um, in Knocknagress, where just at the spot where the lads were shot in the middle of the field. And then this monument was put up in 1935, I think, uh, by a committee again, and it's just in front on the low road, the New England road, um, where um, just below where Pat was shot, there's that monument today, still in the same, still in the same place. And the shooting location would have been just up here, um, just up here in the trees, and then the other lads would have crossed over the road here. So it is quite, it is quite close. And of course, got a very bad picture there. But there's a monument in the Magan that was up um, in the 1950, I think, 
um, to commemorate Pat and all the members of the B Company, the Namagan at Kilmagani uh, uh, Company of the IRA. Um, and then Sean Quinn is remembered in Mullinahone. Um, he's on a monument that actually has two other lads from the village. Sean Brett was accidentally shot. He was in the 7th Battalion as well. Kilkenny Callum lads, he was shot by accident when, clean, when cleaning a gun. And uh, Seamus Egan was shot by anti-treaty forces towards the end of the Civil War. Um, he was from the famous Egan family there near Paracapel. Uh, fellow capital. Uh, but there is lots to us, lots of different history. Sorry for going over time again. It's my habit, but thanks very much for having me. And um, it's been great. I hope you found something interesting in that. That's brilliant, Owen. Thanks a million for that. No problem and, at all. Um, we're going to have a few questions now, if that's at all possible, but fantastic well, listening to it. And I mean, from my own point of view, uh, I'm chairperson of the, the Pat Welch Committee in Dunhamagan and as we said beforehand, it's great that the likes of Pat Welch and Sean Quinn and all that get the recognition that they deserve for what they did for for their 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 villages, but for Ireland as well at the time. Like the volunteerism of Pat Welch was fantastic. I think, you know, you mentioned yep. at the start of your talk there, you know, he was involved there. He was secretary of the Dunmagan branch of the volunteers. He was joint founder of Local Sinn Fein Club. He was a member of Cunner and Aguelga. He organised the volunteers in the area and. He was one of the founding uh, fathers of the GA club in Dunhamagan. Yeah. I mean, there was very little in the area that he wasn't involved in and wasn't yeah. leading. As you said, he was referee, he was Southern board rep, uh, he was county board rep for the club as well. Okay. I mean, for me, even at local level, I don't think he probably gets um, the recognition that he deserves for, for what he did. I suppose one of the events that stands out for me for Pat as well is Gaelic Sunday uh, back in 1918 oh, yeah. when he led out uh, Dunhamagan against Ahenior uh, in defiance of the need to get a permit to play Gaelic games and I suppose even for Pat again it shows the bravery of, of the man and I suppose the people of Dunhamagan and Ahenior as well because this wasn't without danger I think it was in Banner maybe in Ockley where, they, where a match was held and they were baton charged by the police yep. and again it just shows the kind of um, the the spirit that was in Dunhamagan at the time that they were two to four again and Pat captained that team again and he led him out on that day. So um you know I'm I'm absolutely thrilled tonight that we get the opportunity to get the name of Pat Welch out there a little bit further than the confines of Dunhamagan and um thanks a million Owen for your contribution here as well tonight. That's interesting. Um we have a few questions there mm -hmm. but uh, Owen I had a small few slides I was going to show so I might we'll see Where if we can work just from local this just from a local perspective, I suppose. Mm -hmm. So, um, if you will, um, pardon my my self indulgence now from Dunhamagan, uh, yes. Pat Welch of Dunhamagan. So, as you said, Owen, maybe the best commemorated volunteer from from Kilkenny. Mm -hmm. um, so, as you pointed out already, Pat Welch, his homestead there on the right. So, a fairly impressive house, I'd say, for the time, mm -hmm. back around nineteen uh, twenties and that to start nineteen hundreds. And this was his position here as quartermaster position in, in the battalion. You can see him mentioned down here at the bottom of the screen. Um, this is Egan's pub. Now, again, Ned Egan's pub, one of the main meeting places of the Dunhamagan volunteers at the time. And Ned's brother, Jim, played on Tipperary team in Croke Park on Bloody Sunday, and he was later killed during the Civil War. And again, we talk about maybe Pat being a product of the environment he's grown up in and he's experiencing. Pat Welch, in 1920, um, they were planning an attack on the courthouse, I believe, in Kilmagani, and the Black and Tans got word of it. They came to Egan's, where Pat and his, the rest of the volunteers were there. I think my, my granduncle met the Black and Tans at the front door, to which he received the butt of a rifle, and uh, they were tied up and warned that if anything happens in, in Kilmagani that night, that they would return, and, and those volunteers would be executed. Now, the planned attack in Kilmagani was called off, but again, we can see, you know, the, the, the type of environment that was around Dunhamagan at the time. Now, the Black and Tans, I think, came back at two or three o'clock in the morning. They proceeded to drink that pub dry, I think, and wreck that pub and put Pat Welch and his comrades out on the crossroads here, still still bound together. And I think the story goes they were bound together with the strings of a violin or a guitar or something like that, oh, I think. Yeah, yeah, that's, a, that's, a, that's amazing. Yeah, so again, um, so as you pointed out already, the death of where Pat and Sean were shot, the, um, the, the, the headstone there and the one on the road in Tullerone as well, the one in Dunhamagan, 
uh, and the one in 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 Monmahone. Now the, the committee in Donegal, we have made a, a very big effort over the last couple of years to our, organise an annual tour. And uh, yeah. last year we were up in Salahead Bay and not long, and we stopped off in Monmahone on the way back. So there you have the the um the monument to the volunteer remembering the likes of Sean Quinn. And this man here, the second man on the left, is Tony Nolan, whose father Michael also played in Croke Park on Bloody Sunday. Ah uh, yes, he, very so good. He, yeah, he laid a wreath for us on the day. So, um, as you were pointing out, Donegan Village, now you, you, you think that might be 1922, it's a possibility. You can see from that picture, the previous picture, you know, the coming of man and uh, the influence yeah. around the area. A great picture that we uh, just came across. The next one is, this is Anastasia Lahart, who would have been married to Dennis Lahart, and both of them would have been involved in the War of Independence. But, um, I think it just again, I suppose during the War of Independence, we spend a lot of time talking about the involvement of the men. But you know, the the women from Dunamagan weren't afraid to to muck in as well. And uh, where is she from? Sorry, I didn't see that photo before. Where is she? Yeah, I don't have details on where yeah. she originated from. To be honest, or now she was married to Dennis. Now Dennis was shot as well while they were acquiring weapons in Dunamagan at the start of the War of Independence. Yeah, we use some of the first casualties. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Going into, I think it was a Mister Tibby's house was the name. Yeah, he got shot with a shotgun. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So um, the women weren't afraid to get stuck in. I wonder well. where she was from. Yeah, it's quite, it's quite unusual to see the women with the guns. So it's just, yeah. it's interesting. Could just show the military aspect of it as well for women. And yeah, yeah, no, it was a striking picture, all right. Yeah, points. yeah. So just one or two more. You have it there yeah. at the funeral and two graves. Oh, here's the grave, um, at the grave yeah, yeah. and Sean Quinn's grave. Now I think, I think. Um, is that date correct on on the grave? No, the gra I, yeah. no, it's not. But um, I tell you, I'm amazed. Um, every I'd say fifty percent of memory cards, headstones, the date is always wrong. Right. Yeah, people, yeah. It's just that people never really cared. So and they'd no way of checking. So if they put the headstone up a few years later, they'd say, "Oh, yeah. it's on a Friday or a Thursday," and they'd have no other way of checking. So I'm after coming across everything wrong, even birthdays. People yeah. didn't care about their birthday, so there's always a year or two in and out. You'd have to go yeah, back yeah, to the yeah, original yeah. civil cert to get their birthday. But it just yeah. the people didn't care really. It wasn't that they, you know, it was, and it was hard to check it. So they yeah, made the yeah. best guess. <laughs> yeah, and the great, the great um, line at the bottom from the graves of, well, from graves. Oh, from the back, graves of from Pierce's yeah. speech there, with Donovan Ross's grave. Oh, uh, from graves of nations. men, spring living nations. Oh, yes, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. So I think that's a very poignant picture there. I think I was reading about um, Quinn being brought to Mullahone and the tricolour being taken off and so on and yeah. so forth. And huge crowds of Mullahone and members of the column, they obviously couldn't attend the funeral, but they, they attended from afar. They were up above Mullahone looking down on us and they gave a salute as, yeah. as Quinn was being carried through. So a um, strong image there. So, and again, I think this just shows the kind of the barbarity, I suppose, for want of a better word here, of how Pat was treated down in Cork. This is... Um, the inscription from his father on his on his headstone, erected by Matthew Welsh in oh, loving yeah. memory of his son Patrick, captain in the IRA, who was wounded by the British and taken to Fermoy, where the amputation of his leg without anaesthetics caused his death on the 18th of May 1921. So, you can see that you can see the hurt that he's he's still yeah. he's still hurting. Yeah, yeah it's just, it's, just just angry. It's yeah. fairly black and white now. There's no yeah. um it's yeah. amazing when you put that on the stone as well, though, because when you yeah. put the stone like that, it's there forever. So you're Absolutely. not because you know, sometimes people are a little they can gloss over us or yeah. you know, uh, try to talk, you know, but uh, it's interesting. Mm, and uh, the, the graves nicely cleaned up actually there. Sorry, someone must have cleaned it up recently. Yeah, no, again, again, all done voluntarily. The local undertakers here in Callan, they did it for us. So um Brilliant. thanks to them. Yeah. So again, just highlight maybe what other people thought of Pat Welch at the time. So Nick, this was Nicholas Carroll. Uh, who was Vice Commandant of the 8th Battalion, and you can see here talking about Pat Welsh. He was one of the first to spread the gospel of Sinn Féin and Irish volunteer movements in South Kilkenny. Um, so again, Pat, I think, was a significant man at the time in South Kilkenny. And, and, and last... well liked, that comes out again and again. People liked yeah. him. So he yeah. must have been a genuinely nice person, if you know what I mean, just even mm. without, without the whole...